Welcome to the House District 39A Candidates Forum. My name is Marguerite Reinberger, also often called Margo. Two candidates have filed for this position, Republican-endorsed incumbent Bob Detmer and DFL-endorsed Ann Mosey. Thank you both for coming. My co-organizer Beth Johnson and I are proud to be affiliated with the Stillwater Gazette, a sponsor of this candidate forum for 25 years. During this 45-minute forum, each candidate will be invited to give a prepared one-minute opening, one-minute closing, and up to two minutes uh, for questions. At my discretion, I may adjust the allotted time depending on the question how much time we have left as well. Susan Freming from Oak Park Heights will be the timekeeper. She has one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and stop time cards. We request strict compliance. And then I'll make the decision on whether and how much rebuttal time will be allowed, if at all. Finally, for those of you who are here, and I'm very pleased with the attendance, please refrain from talking in order to show your respect to both candidates, those who may not agree with you, and to me. I'll begin opening statements with Bob Detmer. Okay, turn. I'm just going to say, turn your cell phones off. <laughs> hey, who's the moderator here, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> I turned mine off. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, for joining us tonight, and thank you for the Stillwater Gazette for sponsoring tonight's uh, candidate forum, and um, Margo for your uh, being able to serve as a moderator. We discuss, we're going to be discussing tonight some important issues for uh, House File 39A and also for the state of Minnesota. First of all, who is Bob Detmer? I'm a lifelong uh, Minnesota resident, uh, married to Colleen, my wife, for 46 years. Um, Lived in Forest Lake for 45 years, Bemidji State University, Bachelor of Science degree in Health and Physical Education, University of St. Thomas, where I got my Master's in Education, and also a Physical Outdoor Education teacher uh, for 34 years. Served at Forest Lake High School as a head wrestling coach and also assistant soccer and track coach. Three children, seven grandchildren, twin sons, United States Military Academies, and with four deployments in Iraq, Afghanistan. I myself have served 25 years in the United States Army Reserve and mobilized for two years after 9-11. Uh, I chair the Veterans Committee, I State Government Finance Committee on the Tax Committee, Capital Investment Committee, Ways and Means Committee, and also I have other duties with the Military Action Group and a working and a child. Stop, say it. There we go. Yeah, strict <laughs> compliance, you can yell. Because I can too. Okay, Anne, please. Thank you. My name's Ann Mosey, and it was a pleasure to greet everyone in the room. I, many of you have helped, and thank you for that. I'm a family lawyer. Uh, my family's here with me, all my three children and my parents, which is an honor. Um, I've represented people for two decades across the state of Minnesota, and I think that people-centered perspective will be something of an advantage in this role if I'm elected to serve uh, we the people. Um, I have a BA, an MA, and a JD. I won't go into the details. You can check my website at moseyinthehouse.com. Um, I am truly someone who has made a career out of helping the underdog, working for people who don't have a voice, for people who need help, for people who need to connect the dots in order to thrive in their lives. Um, and after doing that for 20 years, volunteering with Tubman for 20 years. Um, I would love to have the honor of serving in 39A, making those changes and positive uh, effects for each and every one of us. Thank you. I'll begin the first question with Bob. Uh, legislatures have uh, generally agreed that additional funding for roads and bridges is needed, but they can't agree on where the money should come from. How do you think the state should fund roads and bridges? For example, would you support a gas increase tax, an increase in gas in the tax, or is there a better approach? Well, if you take a look at what, what we accomplished just the last four years since we've been in the majority, we've put in more money into roads and bridges uh, than it's ever been done before. Both years, we are, we are bonding bills have been uh, just shy of a billion dollars each year, or each biennium. And that was a combination of uh, money on hand and also bonding. Uh, if you take a look at some of the projects that I've done, uh, and if you go to Forest Lake, the Highway 97, the bridge there, uh, I was uh, the sponsor of that 
even though it's not in my district, I sponsored the bill for that because most of the traffic comes from Washington County. And that's, uh, uh, th that's a $9 billion project that I sponsored, and also Anoka County came up with $3, three million, and uh, MnDOT came up with $3 million. So, so, And then if you look in uh, Stillwater here, along the, uh, where the big paddle boats are, that shoreline there where it's eroding, eroding from uh, the flood lines, uh, we got some project work, some money there to uh, build up that, that project. So the combination of uh, bonding money and also money on hand is, is the way to do it. We didn't need to have a gas cat tax. We didn't need to. The money was coming in. Thank you. Ann? Um, so the bonding bill that passed this biennium was less than one would have thought because it's borrowed money, so when the interest rates are low, it's a good idea to borrow more. It's From the Democrats' perspective, it's a jobs bill. Um, it's money that we invest in our unions to build and the infrastructure and um, that sustains our businesses. Um, so it was, it could have been more. It's traditionally been more. It should have been more because actually the biennium year before it didn't pass. So, um, the road that Bob is talking about, Mr. Detmer is talking about, is in your district. It's in 39A. It's in 40. It's in uh, Forest Lake, and um, and and so part of what happened uh, with 97 that you referred to is. Um, because the bonding bill wasn't as much as it could have been, the, there's a bridge in particular uh, that um, perpendicular passes over uh, eight that could have, should have, and would have been able to be expanded as, as is needed, but because the bonding bill was less than it should be, it's only going to get refinished. Um, and in my line of work, when you do something that requires people to come back in and fix it, um, pay more money to do what wasn't done in the first place. That's called malpractice. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, Mark, hang on. Hang yeah. on. I, I'll determine the time. 45 seconds for Bob Detmer and rebuttal. Okay. okay. Yeah, Margo. Uh, the bridge over 35E is in Anoka County, which is not part of my district. That's in uh, the other district just bordering me. So you don't get into Forest Lake until you cross 35E, and you come up, you come about 200 yards in, then you hit Forest Lake. So uh, my district, 39A, and again that was a uh, a nine billion dollar project that I carried for, actually for Anoka County, and because most of the traffic comes from Washington County, and also I am on the task force for uh, the Highway 8. Uh, we're going to be making a Highway 8 uh, a four lane from Forest Lake to Chisago City. And that's going to be a new bridge going up to Highway 8. They're working on that now. And also the split uh, uh, with the 35 oh, thank I and you. E, that's also going that's to be enough. a new bridge. Yeah. Strict compliance. Mm -hmm. You know me. Yeah. Anne, next question. What, if anything more, can the state do to prevent elder abuse? Well, there's a great bill. Uh, it was, I actually have a post on my Facebook site about this. Uh, free from maltreatment, access to records, advanced notice of changes, um, all the things that we would have envisioned should have been passed. Uh, didn't get any signatures from the three GOP leaders in our district, uh, died in committee and, and went nowhere. But it's been written and it's ready to go. Thank you, Bob. Well, if you take a look, uh, some, of the, some of the legislation that we uh, were trying to get through the legislator this year, uh, Senator Housley uh, carried a bill, and uh, again, that uh, was something that she worked very hard on, and now she's campaigning on that also, and also uh, Kathy Lomer has been supporting that too. The three of us support that, and uh, to take care of our elderly, and also uh, as the chief, as the Veterans Affairs Division um, chair, uh, we got three new veterans homes that were approved in the bonding bill this year, one in Bemidji, Montevideo, and Preston. And uh, we're going to be building those homes for elderly veterans, uh, which most of them are World War II veterans, Korean War veterans. The World War II veterans are in their 90s or more. 
and the Korean War veterans in their 80, 80s and plus. And now we're starting to see Vietnam War veterans come into those, those homes too. So we currently have five homes. The federal VA is going to be providing 65% of the, of the funding and the local communities uh, and also the state will come up with the rest, the 35%. So these three communities have already raised millions of dollars for these homes. We've been working on this project for over 10, or sometimes 11 years in some of the communities. So this is something that I think is very important for our veterans, uh, our elderly, elderly veterans. And um, so we're looking forward to, uh, in the next couple of years, to uh, get those homes built. Thank you. I'll begin the next question with you, Bob. Um, should Minnesota, like California, be a sanctuary state? If so, how do you suggest we fund it? Well, we're going to save some money because uh, I don't think we should be funding uh, a sanctuary state. Uh, I think Ronald Reagan made the comments or the statements that uh, a nation without borders is not a nation anymore. And we are, we are a sovereign nation. Uh, we have laws that have to be enforced. And uh, I would be totally disappointed in, if Minnesota became a sanctuary state or if any cities became sanctuary cities because we have laws and those laws have to be, have to be uh, abided by and, and enforced. And I think there's some problems around the country where we think we should have open borders, but I, I certainly uh, am against that. We have m men and women that are guarding our borders as we speak right now. We have men and women that are serving over, over in other countries, giving us the protection that we need around the world. So uh, we are a sovereign nation and we need to keep it that way. And uh, it, it would be a terror to think that we're gonna be uh, just opening our borders and allowing people come in and um, uh, it's one thing, like my grandfather came over from Germany when he was 14 years old, right before World War I, and he didn't like what was going on in Germany. He came over in a boat and worked on farms, became a U.S. citizen, and he homesteaded our dairy farm where my father took over, and that's where I grew up, on a dairy farm. Um, one thing he always told me when we were young kids, he says, never forget what it means to be an American. And if people want to come here and legally and become American citizens, more power to them. We need people. We, we're, we're a country made up of immigrants. So uh, we can't, we can't, we have to stand firm about this whole thing of sanctuary cities or sanctuary states. It's, it's against our law. Thank you, Ann. Uh, we were chatting earlier. We have common ground in some regards, except that I'm a generation newer. So I'm a first-generation American, and my mom and dad are immigrants who came over, and they're here. My dad's from Germany. He left World War II. He had an older brother. He served for his citizenship, the U.S. Army, I think. And my mom, um, she got her citizenship when I was a teenager because she was not sure she didn't want to go back to Denmark, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, but she has now become an American citizen, and I remember that, and it was a really big deal. Um, Sanctuary City is kind of a misnomer. It doesn't cost anything. It's simple, and we are already um, a welcoming city, or a state, sorry. Um, but sanctuary simply means that we don't um, send our... Uh, our forces, our police force and our um, staff to assist the federal government. They do their own job. That's all it means. It's not a co It's actually cost savings to be a sanctuary city. Um, I think what's going on in the country right now uh, in persecuting people uh, based on uh, a contorted uh, system of, of labeling people as illegal has been, um, has been turned into a, a national blemish for our country. And so, yes, I would support what we already are, which is a welcoming state. Okay, um, Bob, I'm not going to allow it, Thank and that's only because she hasn't attacked you right. individually. Uh, feel free, though, to add it on to another um, answer in a, in a subsequent question, but uh, I have too many questions to keep <laughs> going back and forth. Okay, um, 
I'll begin the next question with Anne. Local educators have asked for increased funding for K through 12 education. Would you support a funding increase? If so, how much and where specifically would you want it to go? Um, our Minnesota Constitution requires the state to support schools. Um, Dayton ran on wanting to get back to where we had been and wasn't able to quite get there. Uh, I th what I've read is that if we increased state support for public schools by 3% each year, we would be good. And one benefit that would flow from that is we would not be asking communities to fund bonds and levies in order to do operating revenue. Um, some districts are actually using bonds to do regular maintenance. That's not what it was ever intended to do. Um, the school funding system was changed under Ventura, and he sort of bailed midstream and said, I don't want to do this anymore, and then he didn't run again. So he didn't finish his three-tiered system of funding that was originally intended. So part of that funding that has never happened, and both sides have said it's the formula or it's partisan or it's this or it's that. But sales tax on non-essential items was what Ventura had then in the 80s envisioned. So we've basically been underfunded that long, and it's really a crisis at the moment. Uh, there was a school summit in uh, Chisago Lakes. You were invited and didn't come, Mr. Detmer. Um, and they talked about the shortages in schools across Minnesota. Uh, Stillwater has a shortage of about $500 per student. Forest Lake is over 1,000, and the Chisago Lakes area is, is more even than that. And that is because um, the bonds uh, that were, or the, the bills that, the, omnibus, the bills that were to fund education, the first one that the GOP offered was in, inadequate and vetoed. The second one was also a shortfall, but it passed. And then the emergency funding was vetoed by the GOP. So we sit now with inadequate funding for states. Okay, thank for you. For schools. Oh, thank you. Um, Rob, Bob. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, the uh, GOP did not veto any bills. Uh, only the governor can do that. But uh, educator, you know, in terms of funding for education, if you take, take a look at our, our, uh, our state budget, our biennium budget, we, we put together a two-year budget, the biennium budget. Uh, we're at about $46 billion, $46 billion. And uh, right now, for education, that is uh, $18.75 billion that we're uh, operating under right now. And, and if you take a look at health and human services, I'm sure we're gonna be talking about that. That's about 14 billion. So those two put together makes up the big part of our, our funding for uh, on our, our annual or our bi biannual budget. And if you take a look with the, the in terms of uh, visiting other schools, I visited Chisago City, Chisago uh, School District. I represent Chisago, uh, District. I also represent Forest Lake and, and Stillwater. I've spoken to all three superintendents. And uh, one thing that Forest Lake has a problem with is, is transportation sparsity. Uh, transportation sparsity, Forest Lake is about a million dollars short every year. I passed a bill this, this past session to uh, bring in about $98,000 a year uh, for transportation sparsity. So it's a, it's a drop in the bucket, but that's what I could get through. There's 65 school districts around the state that has a problem with deficits in transportation because Forest Lake is so spread out. We, uh, uh, what the formula has to be changed so it's not per pupil. It should be number of miles that the buses have to travel. So that's what I'm going to be working on this next session is, is working on transportation sparsity. And uh, if you take a look, uh, Forest Lake, uh, this past uh, session, Forest Lake had uh, almost a 5% increase uh, Stillwater, about a 4% increase, and uh, Chisago City also had a little over a 4% increase. So it's a 2% two, two uh, each That's, year. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Bob, um, what more needs to be done with the problem of data privacy? And it is a problem. Well, I think you take a look at some of the legislation that we've been working on the last four years since we've been in the majority. Uh, we've been working on legislation for data data. Uh, uh, securing our, our data that we have in, in the state system. Uh, the problem that you have in some of the agencies, though, the, across the state, uh, whether it's the, 
um, MINLAR or, or some of the different agencies that they just have not, they've been failing. And uh, uh, nationwide we have problems with uh, data security. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, we've been working closely with them because uh, that is an area that uh, uh, because of the um, personal data that goes into uh, the TRICARE medical services that we have at the, at the agency, those are things that we have to protect. And uh, whether it's uh, uh, your social security number or whatever it is, uh, the data security is, is an issue. And, and our side of the aisle has been working on that with, with bills. Thank you. Okay, and I'm actually going to um, uh, ask you, wh what do we need to do for these agencies? I mean, for them to feel, and you're going to get extra time. Okay. Well, the, the agencies themselves, uh, of course, uh, who, who, the commissioners, who assign the commissioners? The governor does. So the governor needs to work with the commissioners of these different agencies and work, uh, work these issues out. If the governor, if these agencies need support from the legislature, if they need new uh, mandates or new laws passed, we will do that. But they also have to work together with the legislature. And, uh, uh, but the commissioners, they're in charge of their agencies. And the commissioner is appointed by the governor. Okay. Thank you. And, and so it's two part. Uh, uh, what more needs to be done on the problem of data privacy? And then how do we get the, basically enforce or uh, get the agencies to get their acts together? Mm. Um, in two minutes. Uh, no, three. <laughs> three minutes. Mm -hmm. While door knocking, I ran into a guy who had had his entire family uh, uh, scammed by someone who took their um, income tax refund. So he was disturbed at the amount of public data that's out there. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is a really huge problem in, in corporations, in government, in voting, in... Um, and obviously also in the agencies, a separate branch of government. Um, one way to address it might be to have an enhancement in, a, in the criminal statute so that it, there's a greater deterrent. Um, I don't know if that would work or not. Part of it is the know-how to take care of some of this stuff is really slowly becoming more and more uh, unreachable for regular people. So you may not even know you have a problem until you do. Um, and I don't have a, a magic wand to fix this, but I know it's a huge problem, and it hasn't been fixed, and it hasn't been addressed. Thank you. And I'll begin the next one with you. What more, if anything, can be done to better protect our schools in the face of violence? Mm. Well, I, um, I like the idea of a, uh, like the courthouse has where you walk through a security check because I want to make sure my kids are safe. I don't like the idea that, that there might be an accident or some horrible experience that would har harm them, and I know everybody feels that way. Um, for whatever reason, schools have been somewhat of a sensational target. Um, it's maybe not... The numbers don't quite match up. I understand that there was an investigative report, and it, we think there were over 200, and there were actually under 100, but it's still too many. Um, so I, I would invest in some safe school protection. I think that that is a good idea, and it is important. I also think it makes sense that when someone ignores a kid and doesn't help them and doesn't speak for them and notice what they're going through, that there should be some consequences there too. The situation in California, there were plenty of warning signs and the school and the community and the family didn't speak up um, until it was just a horrific tragedy. I'm not blaming anyone, um, but one of the benefits of creating laws is creating incentives. So creating incentives for people to speak up, like the red flag laws. I like that idea a lot. Thank you. Bob? Well, if you take a look at some of the legislation that we passed this year, uh, we had $25 million in our bonding bill that we did get through for school security. 
so schools can make improvements, uh, security improvements and, uh, in their facilities. And also we had another $25 million in the supplemental uh, bill that was uh, vetoed by the governor. And I just got a word that uh, there's going to be $36 million coming off for grants for schools in the state of Minnesota for mental health, mental health grants. So it's a, it's a multiple issue here. And I think uh, right now, if you go walking into Forest Lake School, you have to show an ID, you have to push a button, a buzzer, and they'll, they'll let you in. And it's too bad that we have to come to that, but that's the way the world is right now. I think um, I, I, I remember back in the day when I was teaching outdoor education, students had to uh, give a, a five minute or five to 10 minute speech on an outdoor experience. And we had a lot of hunters. And, uh, and trappers uh, in my classes, in the outdoor education classes, and uh, they came in with their, with their weapons, uh, the check them in with the principal, and they would show how to clean a weapon, how to reload shells, and so right in class. Uh, do you think we'd be able to do that today? No, we wouldn't be able to do that today. And in fact, one student came in and, and had a video showing how he dressed out a deer and uh, explained uh, the process and uh, his hunting gear and all that stuff. Um, and that's something that we, in fact, what is the fastest growing sport in uh, with the Minnesota State High School League today is skeet shooting. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sport that's growing like wildfire in the state of Minnesota. But I think um, if you take a look at the amount of money that we put in for school security and safety, uh, that's a big, big push that we did this year. I know there was other bills out there that other people wanted us to do, but we felt that school security should be number one. And I think uh, if you last most of your school districts, they feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you. And Bob, I'll begin the next question. While most states do not do this, should Minnesota continue to tax Social Security as income? Good question there. Uh, how many here are at that age? Okay. Uh, we're starting to phase out the tax on Social Security. There's just a couple states that still have that tax. I just like, it took me 10 years to get rid of the tax on uh, veterans' pensions, where there was only five states that still had that tax. It's easy to start a tax or to add a tax, but it's very difficult to get rid of a tax. So uh, I want to tell you for sure, if, uh, if we're back in the majority, both the House and Senate, and with the governor that will work with us, uh, we will phase out and get rid of that tax on Social Security. Um, I, I really believe that's going to happen. Uh, we feel that we have people on both sides of the aisle that's going to work on that. Uh, I think old age does not, does not uh, attack just one, uh, one party. Old age attacks us all. And uh, I think uh, those that are living on, a, on, a, on an income, on just Social Security, those are some issues that we really need to look at. And uh, I really believe that uh, we'll probably get into some other discussions about tax but uh, if, you're, if you're looking at somebody who's living on a, on a single income like that, um, it's divided up with your, your housing, your food, medical care, and so forth. Why should we be taxing that income on Social Security where you've already played, paid tax on it? So I think, uh, I think eventually in the next couple of years, for, or, um, Minnesota will, will be part of those states that will be getting rid of that tax on Social Security. Thank you. Thank you, and Ann. I think we agree. It's a bipartisan issue. It's a double tax. It's already been taxed. Um, I do know from, you know, working with a lot of people on their finances that um, some people are living paycheck to paycheck on their Social Security, and other people are living on their Social Security while their investments uh, do very well and they don't have to dip into them. So. Social Security to one elderly individual may not be have the same import as another whose life depends on it. Um, I made it to uh, Birchwood Senior Center, and there was a fellow there who was living on $88 a month on his Social Security. So um, they hadn't thought of reaching out to Valley Outreach, so I suggested that. Thank you. And the next question first. Uh, what is one issue you feel so strongly about that you would vote against your party to see that it be adopted or defeated if there is, an, if there is a, if even an issue? There is. I would um, fight for clean water. I, we can't. You know, one of the things I've noticed in uh, working with so many people for 20 years 
is you can be as brilliant as you want to be, but if you can't organize the priorities, it's for nothing. If we don't have clean water, it's for nothing. Thank you, Bob. Well, I think uh, if you take a look at my uh, years that I've served in the legislature and working across the aisle with people too, and I'm taking a look at uh, any issue that I disagreed with my own party, um, I'm, that's hard to think about because, uh, or to, to realize what that issue might be. I think uh, one issue, because I'm a, I was an educator for 34 years and coached, uh, I tried in some cases uh, working through our caucus, working together and try to get uh, this transportation sparsity going for, for the districts. And uh, not until I got <clears throat> the superintendent and some of the board members come in to my office and we sat down with my, with my research people that we start looking at ways we can do it. And now I think I can convince people on my side of the aisle that we can really look at how we can bring more money into those 65 school districts that are short in terms of the transportation and funding for, for education. And I think uh, looking at talking with my research people, I, they're working on it over the summer and putting, get, putting together some language together so that we can go forward and I can share it with our caucus and then talk across the aisle and work it with them. As when I was in the um, minority, many of the years that I served in the minority, I was always able to work across the aisle. They would, I would find somebody across the aisle to work with me. And now that I'm in the majority, um, people from the other side of the aisle will come to me and work on things too. So I think the education funding is an area that uh, I think I need to really work with uh, my own party. Thank you, and I'll begin the next question with you. Uh, should Minnesota lower or eliminate the corporate tax as a way to encourage business development? Well, I think if you take a, <clears throat> if you take a look at the, uh, the federal government, um, if we don't do something uh, in January when we're back in session in terms of tax conformity, uh, Minnesota is going to be having some problems when our people go to go to and uh, start doing their taxes because tax conformity is very important. Not just tax conformity, but also look at our brackets. And uh, it, the bill that we submitted to the, uh, to the governor uh, this year that he vetoed, uh, we, it did not lower the tax bracket for the for the higher tax bracket, but it did lower the other brackets, and uh, and it also conformed to the federal government. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at that as something that we're, we're going to have to work on early in January when we're back in session. And uh, if you take a look at who are the job providers, it's our corporations, our businesses, especially the small businesses. Uh, they're probably hit, hit the hardest in here in Minnesota. Uh, so I think uh, looking at taxes is, you know, talking to people uh, as I'm traveling through the district, Tax is a, is a big issue, and health care is a big issue. Those are the two big issues that we have in, here in Minnesota. So I think uh, um, that is something that we're going to be working on uh, in January also. Thank you. Ann? Yeah, so I think in Minnesota, one of our strongest allies to a strong economy is our small businesses. Um, we have more and more successful small businesses than many states, and we do have tax-friendly laws for them. Uh, there's flexibility, um, and there's uh, uh, opportunity, whether you choose one structure or another structure. Um, it's not simple. Uh, I would not say that it's simple, and I like the idea of simplifying it some more. Um, I think the simpler we make it, the more accessible we make it, maybe take away some of the criminal penalties especially for uh, small businesses, uh, that would be a boon to um, something we're already good at and grow that more. Um, in terms of corporate taxes for large corporations, this is def probably a party line issue. Um, I am not interested in um, what Rebecca Otto called unfettered to the 1%. I think that the stability in our country, it lies with each and every one of us being financially sound. Um, and when 
when, when we end up with more and more money amassed in a small um, por portion of our population, we end up with disparities that cost us all a lot more. Thank you. And I'll begin the next question with you. What more, if anything, can be done to increase health care coverage and reduce costs? What would be your role? So there are two bills that have been written and ready and waiting for at least three years. There's a single payer and there's using the Minnesota care system by a, a nominal infrastructure payment. We could all buy into it. Um, those have been blocked and they haven't been moved forward. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, Senator Marty has a book on it that he's made public so you can understand the one proposal that has been thought through. Um, but these aren't moving forward because they're blocked. Uh, at my dearest friend and door knock extravaganza was knocking with me because she believed in me so passionately with a fractured hip. She didn't realize what the pain was because she didn't want to go to the doctor. She didn't want to go to the doctor because her deductibles are out of control. And as a result, the cost of everything is that much more. Um, so I would like to see health care costs be brought down. I would like to, see, if we did single payer or if we did the Minnesota care buy-in option, it would be the biggest raise for families across Minnesota. Between the premiums we're paying and the deductibles that we have to cover, it would, it would just be a huge amount of money used instead in a vibrant economy instead of all going to insurance companies and big pharma. Thank you. Bob? Yes. I think if we went to the uh, single-payer uh, system that you see happening in uh, some other countries, um, you're, look, you're probably the last thing I read on that. You're looking at uh, around 30, uh, 33 trillion dollars that is going to cost uh, the state of Minnesota uh, to go or to go beyond what we already have. And if you take a look back um, prior to the Obamacare or the so-called Affordable Care Act, Minnesota had 94 percent of its people in Minnesota had health care. We had health care, and we could, uh, but we needed to do something to lower the cost of it. That 6% that didn't have health care, um, many of those were young people that uh, just were in college. They just didn't want to spend the money on, on, uh, health, on health insurance. And then we had a small group that, uh, instead of going to the county, because we had a program, uh, Minnesota Care, we had a program set up for them in the county. All, instead of going to the county, they went to the emergency room, which is expensive. So health care is a big issue, as I mentioned before, uh, here in Minnesota. And I think if we bring back a strong individual market and make that, when you buy a, some health care, uh, health insurance, it should be your policy. It should not just be your, with your employer. So when you change employers, it should travel around with you. And then you negotiate with your employer how much they would like to pay into it. And it should be like cafeteria style. I don't need the same coverage as my wife needs and vice versa. So that can lower the cost. You can also open up the, the boundaries of the state, allow any company to come in here and sell health insurance. That's important because competition will lower the cost. And also tort reform. Some of the law, uh, lawsuits that our doctors are faced with, um, that is passed on to, to the patients. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, our final question for the night, Bob. Uh, what are two priorities in your district that you are absolutely adamant on seeking? Okay, well, good. Two priorities. Uh, number one uh, is the transportation issues that we have in, in the northern part of Washington County and also the southern the part of Chisago County. Uh, those roads and bridges, if, uh, if you've uh, tried to go up to Duluth, I tell people, well, as you, when you get to Hugo, Get, move over to 61, then go north, and uh, when you get up to Wyoming or North Branch, and then head, uh, head back on to 35. Uh, we need to work. Our infrastructure is so important, and uh, so that's a priority for me. And also, being an educator for those 34 years, uh, uh, Forest Lake is, is, uh, is in November 6th, uh, the voters will go to look at a, a levy. I, I, I met with uh, Steve Massey, the superintendent, 
Uh, in fact, the superintendent before Steve uh, was Linda Matson. Uh, she was a student of mine when she was in high school. And I sat down with both of them when they were, uh, and I said, one thing we need to do in public education is talk about all the positive things that we do. Because if something negative happens, it always makes the, makes the press. And so I told Steve when we met, um, and he came up to my office a couple of times. We sat down and chatted. And I said, one thing uh, that people don't understand in public education is that uh, bonding is for bricks and mortar. Levy is for operational cost. And you need to get that word out to the people. And I did uh, submit a letter of support to the superintendent. He's going to put it on, the, on their Facebook or on their website. But I think. I'm also, I, so I, I'm also encouraged what's going on with our charter schools, and also I'm encouraged with the private schools, the Catholic schools that we have, and also homeschooling. I was a guest speaker at the homeschool graduation this year, and uh, they have 200 some students in, in this homeschooling program. They had 18 graduates this year. And uh, one of our charter schools, Leela in Forest Lake, has 1,000 students in it, and the, the other uh, charter school has uh, uh, 500 students. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, so the primary issue that I would like to address for this community would be education funding. It has been inadequate for too long. It is not supposed to fall on the backs of levies and bonds. And if we increase it, instead of, it was not that the um, GOP vetoed the governor. It was that the governor begged the GOP to please pass emergency funding, it would have been $126 per student so that we wouldn't feel the pressure of the bill that did pass in this next academic year. Um, for Forest Lake, it would have been half their deficit. Uh, and so that's what I meant that, that the GOP refused to do. Um, so that's something that I feel very strongly about. We should not be uh, fighting amongst ourselves um, over policy when the real problem is that the funding hasn't been sufficient. Um, and for my second priority, I would say funding education. It's the same priority. I, it, it is so important that we take care of our kids. Every dollar spent on our kids multiplies 20-fold in our economies. It's not money wasted, it's money invested. Thank you. Can you rebut in 20 seconds? Yes, I can. Okay. In terms of the, uh, the supplemental bill that we put forward uh, on the, the tax bill and also the education bill, we had over $103 million more dollars in that than what the governor asked for. And he still vetoed, vetoed uh, that supplemental bill. So uh, if you take a look at what, what, what has happened since 2005, and also, uh, this last session, uh, since we've been in Stop. we Okay. Susan, don't be shy. <laughs> Force these guys. Um, one minute closings. Anne. So in closing, I would like to highlight that the bill that Detmer uh, spoke of is a 989-page bill that came out 10 minutes before the deadline and included everything in the world, including that beet juice on the road would no longer be an offense. And it was vetoed because of the, I'm not kidding, that is in the bill. Um, it was that expansive, that inclusive, and that broad. It included policy that w the governor didn't agree with. And it was vetoed even though there were good things in it because there were so many other things in it. Um, I think the most important thing that we can do to re gain trust in our government is accountability and transparency. The private systems should mirror the public systems, and we should have rules that make sense um, instead of creating loopholes. Um, my race is about the whole community and about supporting everyone um, instead of using political gamesmanship at the cost of our kids and uh, at the cost of our communities. Thank you. And Bob? Okay. What I'm going to do, I'm going to close with uh, what my philosophy is in terms of my political philosophy. Number one, I believe in a limited governor, government is the best government, and the free enterprise is the best path to prosperity for all Minnesotans. Number two, I, we need to make government better, not, not bigger. 
I support reducing taxes, spending, regulations, and creating businesses opportunities for our hardworking families and their businesses. I believe that parents are responsible for their children's education and that parents, teachers, and local school boards can make the best decisions uh, for their education. I recognize the sanctity of life, the central role of the traditional family in our society. Having been in the Army Reserve and in the military for 25 years, I also understand that the peace, that peace is best maintained through a strong national defense. And with that, I humbly ask for your support and that we may maintain our majority in the House and the Senate and also get Jeff Johnson as our, as our governor. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll finish with my closing statement. Alicia Laban, the managing editor of the Stillwater Gazette, is in the back writing up your responses. They'll appear in the Friday, October 26th newspaper. The write-up will be disseminated to the Forest Lake Times, which is also owned by the, um, uh, the parent company is Adams Publishing Group, and they now own both of those newspapers. Your form will be replayed on Valley Access channels and on Lakes Area Television. And on behalf of the Stillwater Gazette, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.